Welcome to Humanist Views, a program where we look at current issues from a humanist point of view. I'm Scott Lohman. On tonight's program, we're going to take a look at something very current. We're going to take a look at energy and its importance to our society and what solutions we can do as we start looking at things like peak oil, um, pollution issues with the energy sources we use now, and what are some alternatives that we can look for in the future, and what are some of the solutions? Is there a magic bullet out there, or is it a lot more complicated than that? We'll find out, so stay with us. My guest tonight is Maggie Horth Baker. Welcome, Maggie. She has a book out called Before the Lights Go Out, um, which takes a look at energy, and she traveled around the country and looked at our energy grid and, and how we do energy in this country and how we can sort of figure out how to do energy as we go into the future, as things are aging and our energy sources need to be changing. So welcome, Maggie. Thank you for having me. So what prompted you to write the book? Well, my husband actually works in the energy industry. Okay. He uh, is an energy analyst for buildings. So what he does is figure out how to make a building as energy efficient as possible for the least amount of money. Okay. And he got this job in 2006. And he started coming home every day with all of these stories about how his clients didn't understand how the energy system worked. You know, you had mm -hmm. these people whose job it was to make decisions that affected energy use, mm -hmm. but they didn't really understand what was going on in the background. And the more he talked about that, the more it made me kind of want to write something that would sort of bridge that gap between energy experts mm -hmm. and the people who actually have to make decisions about energy, because it's usually not the scientists yep. and the engineers right. that have to do that. It's the politicians and the building owners and you, know, the business you owners, and I. And yeah. Yeah, so they would need an education on how energy works and why it's important, why you want to decide X versus Y, as opposed to they're looking at X and Y, and it's like, uh, how can I tell the difference? Yeah, and sort of understanding how all these different factors work together, so you get kind of this big picture view that doesn't come through a lot when you're just reading one newspaper article here and another thing there. Yeah, so it's a lot more complicated than that. So Yeah. <laughs> what, what was the, the neatest thing you found out about our, our energy system? I think the neatest thing for me was finding out that we have these centers all over North America. Mm -hmm. And they are staffed by people 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's these people's jobs to basically make sure that our electric grid doesn't crash. And wow. they have to manage this in a really analog way, like calling people up on the telephone, mm -hmm. kind of analog. They have to manage it on like a minute by minute basis. Because the grid moves really, really fast. Okay. You know, if you have a power plant go offline mm -hmm. in Arizona, you can tell in less than a second that that's happened as far away as Canada. Wow. And these guys have to make sure that we have this constant balance between electric supply and electric demand happening everywhere on the grid all the time, constantly. That really sounds really, it sounds like child, you know, really complicated and makes the air control system almost like child's play in keeping airplanes in the air. It has a lot of similarities, I think, with air traffic control. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's these people that just work behind the scenes that you never really think of, you seldom see, but they are integral to making sure our entire lives work. Yes, which I've noticed, because in my part of Minneapolis two years ago, we had a tornado come through. Right. And so that definitely affected the power grid for a week, just a week for me, but two weeks for other part of the city. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, is important to know how that works and why it can take so long to get those repairs in there. Oh, yeah, definitely. So as we look at our energy future, what are the things that are the biggest challenges we have to face? I think one of the biggest challenges is that the simple fact that there's so much that has to sort of get fixed all at once. You know, I, we often talk about if you're into alternative energy, it often kind of seems like, well, if we just had the political willpower, mm -hmm. then we could build more wind turbines or we could build more solar panels. We could just solve this problem. It's just all about the politicians. Mm -hmm. But it actually is a lot more complicated than that. That's kind of, I guess, my mantra at this point. Okay. Um, because you have not just this political thing. It's not just about convincing people that climate change is real. Mm -hmm. It's also about how you get all of these different utility companies that don't really necessarily want to work together to work together. How you alter this electric grid system that nobody ever designed. It just mm -hmm. sort of evolved by itself over time. How you turn around and take this imperfect system and mm -hmm. modify it to do what we want it to do in the future, which isn't easy and isn't cheap and is going to take a lot of time. And how you get sort of all of these different things to happen all at once from how we 
manage electricity in our homes mm -hmm. to how we manage it on the grid to how we produce it, all of these different things. And it's, it's a huge undertaking. And it's actually one of the things that makes me the most pessimistic about energy <laughs> is that yes. we have never really taken on something like this in a really intentional way before. Yeah, it sounds like it's been cobbled together. Almost it's like <clears throat> how human evolution came to our brain, yeah. which is like, okay, this, part, this happens to work because these guys over here stayed alive. But so. it's, it's very much like that. I mean, the early, if you look at the early development of our electric grid, it's very much just this little piecemeal thing where all these people working independently did what happened to be cheapest and went up quickest and got the job done and then slowly had to kind of tie those things together. And we just have this big ad hoc mess in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. And if we had a hundred years to just sort of let it slowly evolve again, that'd be one thing. Mm -hmm. But since we're trying to make this shift so much faster than that, that's really the hard part. Yeah, and it, it, it could have its equivalence in the, in, in the internet, but that is a totally different animal on how that gets hooked into it. I liked how you talked about in the book on uh, how one of the earlier earliest power systems is put in is how they knew it was working well when they watched the light bulb. Yeah, yeah, and that's the, that, back to that balance between electric supply and electric demand. To make sure that that happens at, in the earliest systems, instead of having these guys in, you know, mm. facilities all over the place, what they had was a dude who sat in a shack down by the river in Appleton, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and he just stared at a light bulb all day. And if the light bulb got too dim, or if it got too bright, he knew that supply and demand are out of whack, and they needed to adjust something on the grid. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's always been manual. It just was worse at one time. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it, some of the stories that they had from those really early days of the electric system were just hilarious, where they would, you know, if you had a short at that time, you had no way of knowing where it was. So they would have to just send out electric utility guys from house to house hunting down the shorted wire. <laughs> oh, hi. And that might take an hour. It might take three days. Okay. And in the meantime, there's no electricity. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, yeah, that is, it's still amazing that we went from that to even having a semblance of order in what we have nowadays. It's astounding, yeah. So what can, you know, you, you mentioned that this is just so complicated, it's kind of hard for even one person to grasp all of that nationwide. But there are things we can do as individuals. There are some things we can do as individuals. Um, Part of what I try to get across in the book is that there are the things you can do within the flawed system, and then there are the things you can do after the flawed system is fixed. Okay. And the things you can do after the flawed system is fixed is a lot bigger. Oh, I'm sure. And I, I try to use transportation as an analogy for this, because it's a lot easier to understand, I mm -hmm. think, for most people. Like, you know, I live in Minneapolis. I am about a half a block from a number six bus stop. Okay. And that means I can hop on that bus. I can go anywhere in the city I basically want to go, because it's a really great line, right? Mm -hmm. And between that and bicycle trails, I and my husband can get along with just one car. Mm -hmm. But I'm from Kansas City. My family is okay. from down there. And if you go down there, they don't have anything like that. Like the bus system is atrocious, can't get you anywhere. Really. And ours doesn't get the best reviews, so that, that's a scary oh, it's, thing. It's, when I moved up here, like this bus system was, blew my mind. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, that tells you something. Okay. Yes. Um, and they don't really have any bicycle tracks, okay. tracks at all. So what they have, if, you know, if, you, if, I told, if I told one of my aunts or uncles or my cousins to get rid of a car, I'd be telling them to shoot themselves in the foot. Okay, yes. Because without that car, they couldn't access their jobs, they couldn't get to public services that they need and want, they couldn't participate in their communities in any mm -hmm. way. You know, you have to change that infrastructure before you can start expecting people to make individual decisions that are good for the environment in a lot of cases. Okay. Because there are some things that we can do, right? I mean, we can mm -hmm. buy a more energy efficient car, mm -hmm. or we can, you know, try to drive less. But at a certain point, you're hemmed in by the way your infrastructure works. Exactly. And yes. you have to change that infrastructure before your choices can progress. So it's almost sometimes like two steps forward and one step back um, as we advance on things. Because I know the establishment of the bike trails here in the Twin Cities have been a long, arduous process. Oh, absolutely. 
but Absolutely. it's also gotten us ahead of Portland, which they are seriously jealous that our bike riding is up ahead of theirs. <laughs> so we've got that. Okay, so as we try and figure out how to do that, is there anything going on locally or nationwide for people starting to realize that we need to do this as a big organized bunch to try and solve the problem? There's not, I don't think any, as far as I've ever noticed, there's not any you know, major activist push of, hey, we need to revitalize our electric grid. Like that's, it's not the sexy thing to latch on to, right? <laughs> yep, yeah, infrastructure does not get and a whole lot of people excited. No, it's, it, it's kind of the thing people don't care about much. Um, but there are things that you can do locally. And one of those things is getting involved in like your local municipal zoning boards. Okay. Mm -hmm. and these are really easy things to get involved with. I've gone to a couple meetings, and most of the time, unless you get something you know really contentious, they're really small little gatherings, and just about anybody can speak. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those places where you really have an opportunity to change, to help change infrastructure on an individual level because you can go in there and be like, you know, I want a more dense city. Mm -hmm. I want a city where it's easier for me to walk from my house to a lot of different businesses, to schools, to churches, to restaurants. Mm -hmm. And how we do that is by building up instead of building out. Okay. And you can play a role in how that zoning happens so that you can make your city a more walking friendly, more biking friendly place to be. Yeah, and I know they're working on that because uh, it used to be that way where you'd have the corner stores where you could just walk to something. but as other parts of the economy changed that affected that. So mm -hmm. it sounds like we need to move put into a more systematic approach to looking at that. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, it's, and it's again, this kind of gets back to that whole infrastructure development thing. It's one of those things that's hard to do on an individual by individual basis. Mm -hmm. um, there are definitely things that are happening to improve our electric grid. We have, um, for instance, like some of the money from the Recovery and Reinvestment Act has been going into upgrading the electric grid and making it a lot more digital, which some of those things you would see mm -hmm. as, a, as a customer, you know, you'd see like smart meters or something yes. like that, which a lot is something a lot of people have heard of. Yes, I um, but, have one of those in my house. Oh, there you go. Yep. But then other things you'd never even ever seen in your entire life. I mm -hmm. mean, just uh, something called a phaser measurement unit that's just this little electronic box in a server farm somewhere. Mm -hmm. And what it does, you know, I told you that you can see changes happening on the grid in less than a second. Right. The guys that, the grid controllers, the guys that are, that help manage the grid, I think, if I'm recalling correctly, in 2002, when the big blackout happened on the East Coast, mm -hmm. they only got updated with information every 30 seconds. So you can see the huge gap yes. that they were missing. And that's actually one of the reasons that blackout happened, okay. is because they weren't getting information fast enough to know what was happening and changing. Wow. And those phaser measurement units speed that up. Hmm. So we're down, I think, to about 15 seconds. And the more of those we get in there and the more changes we make behind the scenes, we can scooch that up a little bit and improve that. And that's something that as we improve how quickly information gets to these guys that control the grid, that also enables us to add in more of wind and solar. Mm -hmm. It enables us to have a stronger grid. It enables us to prevent blackouts. So it's a good thing in a lot of different ways, but it starts with this really unsexy, easy to not notice thing happening in the background. So, so, okay, so we see those changes going through on that part. And you're mentioning wind and solar, but it, you're from what I've got is that it's not easy just to, you know, just put up a bunch of windmills and everybody stick, you know, those things on their roof and voila, it works well. We know it's, you know, it's not going to work that easy. Yeah, and that's because, as I said, the grid evolved and it evolved co-evolved, mm -hmm. if you want to say it, put it this way, along with these sources of energy that are really easily controllable or controllable to some extent. So mm -hmm. if you think about you know, coal, natural gas, mm -hmm. hydroelectric, even nuclear to a certain extent, they're all things that those grid controllers can get on the telephone and call up and say, hey, we need you to produce more electricity or we need you to produce less electricity, and they can do that. Mm -hmm. They can respond to what the grid needs. Wind and solar are kind of different, right? Yes, definitely. You can only produce what's there and available. And sometimes that fluctuates throughout the day and you don't have control over that. And it's not a huge problem because we don't have a lot of it on the grid right mm -hmm. now. I think nationwide we have about 1% wind and 1% of our capacity comes from wind and less than that from, from solar. solar. That, would, that would make sense. Something like that. I think it might be up to 3% wind at this point. Um, but 
that adds just this little bit of instability into an already kind of unstable system. And the more and more you add in, the harder and harder it is to control that balance between supply and demand. And so I've had experts, what they tell me is that we can get to about 25 to 30% of our capacity, electric capacity, coming mm -hmm. from wind and solar okay. before we're going to have to make big changes to the grid, way the grid works. And that means some of these you know, behind the scenes technical things I was telling you about. It also means things like storage, which we have none of right. on our grid right now. Mm -hmm. um, it just It's a lot of these little different things that will enable us to bring in these resources that we can't really tap in the way we want to tap yet. Yeah, so uh, it, and it's great that, that you're explaining this way because it makes it easy to understand if you look at it, you know, as all the wires as a grid and that you can put in the pieces, but only when they're working mm -hmm. when it comes to those parts. Right. So as... Um, You've looked at different energy sources. Uh, you also talked about peak oil in there, mm -hmm. as well as um, looking at coal and, and nuclear. All right, so with those now technologies, what's going to be our best to sort of help us move forward before we get to a certain, have to really redo the grid? That's kind of a hard question, because it's one of those things where there's not an absolute right answer. Mm -hmm. Um, because of how long and how much money it's going to take to make big infrastructure changes on the grid. I mean, infrastructure, by yes. the way, happens, you know, when they say short term with infrastructure, they're talking about like 30 to 40 years. So this is, this is not like a yeah, snap that, your fingers thing. Yeah, not a snap thing. thing on that too. We have to have something, you know, we can't just flip over immediately. Mm -hmm. There has, there's going to be a long time where we're still using hydrocarbons or something. Mm -hmm. um, and... I don't know that there's an absolute right answer. We know that natural gas is produces fewer emissions than coal and is safer in some ways in terms of what it emits into the atmosphere besides carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. But there are drawbacks to that because then you kind of get into the whole fracking thing yes. and the side effects of that. Uh, you know, nuclear obviously produces far, far fewer emissions, mm -hmm. but then it has its own drawbacks. Yep, you have the stuff you have to store for 10,000 years. Right, and you have the political yes. issues, which are huge, and which I don't think you can just discount. You know, they're Correct. a part of this mix. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a lot of, one of the things you have to understand is that everything has drawbacks, and there's not a perfect solution. Even when you're talking about wind and solar, everything has drawbacks, because mm -hmm. we're going to have to spend billions of dollars to make a grid that can accommodate those things. So it's, it's not a really easy answer, and I think it's something that, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot when it comes to evidence-based policy is that scientists and science can tell you what something might do. Mm -hmm. We can give you probabilities about how systems work, but it can't tell you absolutely what choices you should make. And a lot of times, we, I think we think about science and we think about evidence-based policy and we expect the scientists to come in and tell the politicians exactly what to vote on and exactly how to structure a bill. Mm -hmm. And that's not what science does. You know, if you talk to climate scientists, what they'll tell you is, you know, we can't tell you how to fix the climate. Mm -hmm. We can just tell you what's happening. You still have to go in and do the negotiation of what are our priorities. What drawbacks are we willing to live with and which ones we aren't? And we have to kind of have those conversations as a population, as governments, and come to some kind of conclusion. You know, science isn't going to tell you exactly what to do. Yeah, it'll give us the ideas, but then we also have to go, well, if you do X, this is causes these things, mm -hmm. and Y causes these things over there. So right. then that brings up, you know, the other challenge is move on is that you're also a science writer. Mm -hmm. um, on um, on a website as well as for other places. And how can we help get out a good science education for people so that we can have these discussions? Because when we have schools that don't want to teach evolution in yeah. schools, how can we get them to understand how global climate change is going to affect us as well as the complicated energy grid? Well, you know, I'm not an expert in uh, science education, but in my experience, the best science education I had as a kid was stuff that wasn't just about memorizing facts. And when I talk to my readers, when I have conversations with them in comment sections online, what I feel I get is that there's a lot of people who get confused by the way science works because what they learned of it in school was this memorizing absolute facts mm -hmm. thing. 
They didn't learn critical thinking. They didn't learn how to solve a problem. They just learned that this is the answer to this question. And so when you get into a situation where the answers are changing, mm -hmm. or where there are totally new questions we don't totally know the answers for yet, everything kind of starts to get fuzzy and confusing, and they don't really know how to deal with that in a lot of ways. So I think that you know, the best science education we can do is really teach people how science works rather than just the answers science has come up with. And also teach them a little bit about uncertainty and about how we try to understand things where we don't know all the answers, where we can only kind of see the shadows of things up on the wall, mm -hmm. how we try to understand those better as we go along and improve our understanding over time. Yeah, that's definitely you know the tricky part, because I think part of the disconnect between, say, those of us who go with the science-based and some people in certain parts of religion, is they keep looking at science as that set of facts, mm -hmm. and they keep going, you guys keep changing the facts on us. And it's like, well, A, we keep learning more, and B, you don't have the right understanding of science. Right, and I think, I mean, it, I think that comes out of their culture in a very mm -hmm. obvious way. I mean, it, it comes from, you know, you have this book of facts, <laughs> and here's another book of facts that we can add to that book of facts, and then we have books of facts. Mm -hmm. um, and, then it, and then it also kind of comes from this religious tradition of science from the beginning of the scientific era, where you have people like Linnaeus just cataloging things. And you kind of want to just have, again, a book of lists and mm -hmm. facts. And that's not necessarily how science works in the modern world. It's a lot messier than that. It's a lot harder to necessarily get your head wrapped around what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's, there's sometimes where we can't see the jaguar. What we see are the bones of things that it's eaten and maybe it's poop. Yes. And we have to start figuring out what this animal is based on what we can see rather than actually being able to observe it ourselves. Yeah, I think part of the issue is, is, is science was not taught as a tool, but was taught as a category like history mm -hmm. and economics and that. And right. those of us who get into science, as I came in it from you know, some school, but as a science fiction reader, I get into the, how that's used to discuss ideas, how to project ideas, how to use that as a problem-solving technique. Right. And not everybody gets excited about that part, but they can see some of the fun as you bring it through. Mm -hmm. So if we can find ways to do that. Um, the other thing is that we also, you're good about, in your book, about showing critical thinking and problem-solving skills. And um, do you also explore that with your, in writing your columns? Um, you know, I definitely try to. One of the things that I'm doing right now, I have a monthly column now with the New York Times Magazine, and it's about the intersection between science and society. So not just social sciences, but also how technology affects culture and how it changes culture. And there's some really interesting aspects of problem solving that come up in that because you kind of have to look at not just what these facts are, but all these different things that are affecting mm -hmm. how those facts got made. I just finished up a column about life expectancy in the United States. Okay. And I think that's one of those things that it's easy to forget is affected by culture. Mm -hmm. Because we think of it as this technological thing. You know, We oh, solved sure. childhood mortality, and we drove this up through medicine and through technology. But if you actually look at what's going on today and the fact that in the US, we actually have kind of not totally stagnating, but very much slowing down in our growth of life expectancy in this country. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the evidence points to that that has a lot to do with social factors, with the fact that the medical problems we need to solve now are affected by decisions that we make, are affected by the cultures we grew up in, what foods we eat, whether we smoke, um, and even things that we can't have any direct control over at all, like whether we got unlucky enough to be born and raised in a part of town that had a lot of asbestos and lead, yes. and how those things affect us throughout our entire lives. And if you aren't looking at problem solving, and if you aren't trying to understand this bigger picture and how context fits into facts, mm -hmm. it's really easy to miss that there's this big social element of this thing that can otherwise be kind of brushed off as technological. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's interesting because you're looking at the fact that we as humans are herd animals and how we kind of solve problems is, is those connections go deeper than just our individual societal connections, but how we structure society, how we structure our food sources and all of that. So it, that's a 
getting deep and complicated. Yeah, well, not just tool making primates, we're social primates too. Yeah, you know, as far as, you know, and talking about that and the technology is that a device, communications device that I have, I'm using as a timer now, but <laughs> how smartphones are changing the way we're doing our society as well. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely some implications for that. I don't know anything, like that's not something that I've personally written much about, mm -hmm. but um, I mean, I think it's, it's an interesting thing. It changes the way that we talk to each other. It changes access that we have to information, which completely changes conversations. I mean, I'm sure you've been in a bar conversation in the last five years where a question came up and somebody answered it in two seconds. 30 years ago, that wouldn't have happened. No, you'd still had a discussion trying to figure it out. So. <laughs> and now you all know the answer. Yeah, and that, that, that's, you know, some of the stuff I'm finding fascinating, because when you look at that, um, you know, science fiction has been used to predict things, but some of the things happening now, they couldn't figure out, you know, 20, 30, even, you know, sometimes even five or 10 years ago, they're not seeing those changes. What you imagine from, you know, your projected trends today is often not the direction that it goes because all these other little things come in and affect it and push it in different different ways, yeah. Yeah, so look at that. Um, we're coming towards the end of the program. So mm -hmm. first, where can people find you to read your stuff? Ah, so I am the science editor at boingboing.net, and you can find me there pretty much every day. Okay. I'm also a columnist for the New York Times Magazine. You can find me in there about once a month on Sundays. And uh, my book is in, before the lights go out, yep. is in bookstores everywhere yep. and, and online. Find it on the electronic version. And you can also go to your friendly neighborhood library like I did mm -hmm. on that and make use of that. So coming down, what things would you like people to start doing to try and say, okay, you've got my attention about we need to work to things. How can I start educating myself on energy in the complex world we're in? I think it's really valuable to try to understand how energy works as a system, spend some time reading and researching before you jump into activism. Because I think that it's really easy, and it's easy for me even, mm -hmm. to hear somebody saying something that sounds like something you want to be involved in, but unless you know the bigger context, you don't know whether that makes sense or not. And it, for instance, in the course of this, I have become, in course of researching and writing this book, I became very skeptical of Greenpeace, that it, where I wasn't before. Mm -hmm. And I don't sign up with their things mm -hmm. anymore in a way that I used to. Because once I started to find out how this stuff worked and compare that with a lot of the things they were actually saying and statistics they were bringing in, it didn't really match up. So I think having that background is a good place to start before you actually try to do anything. I think really far too often we jump into doing before we're learning. Yeah, so find out about the whole bigger picture and where some piece might fit in rather than just diving in and saying, we got to work on X. Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay, thank you very much, Maggie. Thank you. Appreciate having you here. Yeah. Uh, Maggie's book is Before the Lights Go Out, and you can find that all sorts of places. And also, we'd like to hear what you think about our program and what we cover here in the show. We Give us a call. Well, actually, you can't call us anymore. But uh, you can send us an email or one of those old-fashioned lettery things that you stick in an envelope and mail. We'd like to hear what you think and topics you'd like to see us cover in future programs. You can also find out more information about the Humanists of Minnesota at our website of humanistsmn.org. Uh, Thank you for joining me on this edition of Humanist Views. I'm Scott Lohman. Good night. <laughs>